right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom O'Leary, I'm the Executive Vice President here at Potomac Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all again. Uh, I recognize most of the faces, so I think most of you have been here before, so welcome back. Uh, today it's a, it's a great pleasure that we introduce uh, one of our newest uh, senior fellows uh, on our circuit here, Professor uh, Williamson Murray, also known affectionately as Wick. Wick and I are old comrades going back uh, many, many years and in, uh, in many different things spanning the globe that we've done together in some research. Uh, Wick joins the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies uh, via Yale University, the Air Force, Ohio State University as a distinguished uh, professor and professor emeritus from Ohio State from their uh, noted history department. Then uh, he also held numerous chairs at the Army War College, the Naval War College, the Marine Corps War College, the U.S. Naval Academy, um, been a lecturer on many, many other things, uh, a noted person within the defense community. Uh, most people who have done a lot of reading of WIC will recognize his writing, and there are many people who might take credit for, for WIC Murray's writing and some of the most thoughtful pieces that have come out. Anybody who read the Joint Operating Environment uh, that came out of GIPCOM that is in many ways attributed to General Mattis, and it certainly is General Mattis's thinking and belief, but when you read, uh, when you read the writing, it has that uh, that Williamson Murray behind it. So uh, you know who the principal author really was on the joint operating environment. It was, uh, it was Professor Murray. <clears throat> One of the things, too, is uh, his new book is, is a very, very book on the shaping of grand strategy. And it will be for sale here uh, at the end of the thing if the book representative shows up on time. <clears throat> but another book, my favorite personal book of, uh, of Wicks, and he's got many, many uh, books to choose from, is one that he co-authored uh, on World War II and it was called The War to Be Won. It's probably, I think, the finest operational study of World War II. Rick's portion was on the European theater. He takes a very, very complex endeavor, World War II, probably our most successful uh, in, you know, war that we've been involved in, and pairs it down and really takes a complex thing and, and tells you how the operational from all perspectives was. But a particular thing, the reason why it was so enjoyable, Rick talks about a very serious subject educate you and does it with very subtle humor. And so someone who can educate you on World War II and still find in a very serious subject to inject humor, it, it really makes it a very pleasant read. So it's much more than a textbook. It's a very enjoyable read. So a great uh, pleasure. I introduced uh, Professor Murray, who will talk about his uh, latest book. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> um, I might uh, start off by uh, indicating uh, sort of my general philosophy of history, uh, which uh, really uh, uh, is best summed up by uh, a uh, skit that two British comics uh, made in the uh, early 1970s, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. The skit was entitled The Frog and the Peach. Um, Peter Cook was the owner of a restaurant located in the middle of the Yorkshire Bogs. No difficulty uh, in parking, just in extracting cars afterwards. Um, uh, and Dudley Moore was the food critic of the of uh, some important uh, London paper. Um, uh, and over a long course of about 10 or 15 minutes of, of the insanity that those two were capable of, um, one of the two specialties of the house, frog a la pêche, a large frog brought to your table with a peach in its mouth and boiling Cointreau poured over it or pesh a la frog, a large peach brought to your table with boiling Cointreau poured over it when you cut it open, uh, tadpoles swim out. At the end of this long discus uh, discuss discussion, uh, Dudley Moore says, uh, and have you learned from your mistakes? And I think this uh, really sort of sums up the human race over the last 5,000 years. Uh, yes, I have gone over, Peter Cook says, I've gone over my mistakes from every point of view, studied them again and again, and feel fully confident I can repeat every one of them. Um, let me say a little bit, uh, let me give you sort of the outline of what uh, I'm going to uh, uh, be talking about. Let's see, page down. Mm. Let's try page up. Mm. Page down. Well, we may not have any slides. Uh, oh, that page. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> There's the outline of what I hope to do today. Uh, sort of cover the uh, major 
uh, um, topics uh, um, that are in uh, the book uh, as well as to lay out um, uh, a number of the authors and, and case studies so, um, uh, to give you a set, sense of that, what we were trying to do. The, the project uh, began um, uh, in, uh, and actually I think I'll go back. Uh, the project began uh, in the fall of uh, 2008 with General Mattis. Uh, um, I just finished uh, doing the joint operational environment for him about six to eight months before. Uh, called and said, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in having a, a conference done uh, on uh, the issue of grand strategy because everybody in Washington is talking about grand strategy and how the United States needs uh, some form of grand strategy. And it would be very useful to maybe get a historical perspective, it, perspective on it. And again, General Mattis uh, um, uh, owns approximately somewhere between six and 7,000 history books. So this is a general who has obviously read a great deal and thought a great deal about these subjects. And so I set up the conference, um, very much used uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, approach that I've used in the, in the past, except this was somewhat uh, more rushed than most uh, uh, conferences uh, that I, I've run. Um, got a number of historians, John Lynn, uh, um, some political scientists, Colin Gray, uh, myself, uh, um, uh, Colonel Rick Sinright to write a series of essays uh, dealing with, uh, um, six, for the most part, successful periods of, of uh, where grand strategy has actually um, been successful. Um, although John Lynn did Louis XIV, where French grand strategy was not, obviously, not all that successful. I think, let me underline, uh, one of my major intellectual interests uh, over the past uh, two decades, three decades, has been the subject of st strategy, very much uh, influenced by my time at the Naval War College, uh, which I believe uh, uh, the strategy and policy uh, course uh, at Newport is not only the best uh, um, examination uh, of, uh, of uh, the subject of strategy, but uh, also uh, um, the, the finest faculty for the study of strategy uh, anywhere uh, in the world by far and away. And there are, of course, uh, other approaches uh, uh, that one might use. Uh, there is uh, the uh, Washington approach, uh, um, which uh, seems to believe that if you get uh, um, somewhere between uh, 20 and 50 uh, colonels with an IQ of 120 each that you can produce a document that, uh, that is uh, um, of Einstein's quality. Um, uh, <laughs> I was reminded that an admiral friend of mine uh, was asked to comment uh, on the uh, uh, military strategy two years ago when the draft was being uh, uh, sent around. Uh, uh, and he wrote back, uh, um, I think, which pretty much sums up most of the Washington documents on national strategy. He said, if you take out um, every place where the United States appears and every place where um, American appears and replace it with Iceland and Icelandics, uh, it will be equally applicable to Iceland uh, as to the United States, which I think sums up uh, sort of the... Uh, the, if you will, pet rock collections uh, and the incapacity to address unpleasant, difficult issues uh, uh, in, the, in, in the city. Um, the approach we used uh, is, I think, very much uh, summed up by a wonderful quote from Clausewitz uh, about the fact that in the final analysis, the study of war, the study of strategy, is, is a matter of art rather than of science, and that it, it requires, uh, if you will, a broad and deep knowledge of uh, the historical analogs and the past, um, uh, if you will, to uh, understand the present. Uh, um, in fact, I have argued uh, um, more uh, recently, and it's going to appear in a book of articles that's going to appear sometime in the fall, uh, that the fundamental problem is that to understand the future, you have to understand the present. <laughs> the only way to understand the present is to understand where we have been. In other words, the past and history. That if you don't, 
uh, understand the present because of your refusal to address uh, uh, history uh, in terms of your analysis, then of course any road will do, which is I think all too much been characterized American approach to international relations since the end of the Cold War, and for portions of the Cold War. Um, I think there are several fundamental truths um, that underlie, I think, the historical uh, view of grand strategy. And I would sum them up by saying that certainly my view is, uh, uh, first of all, we live in a nonlinear universe where the combination, if you will, of imponderable impact things impact on the course of events and make them almost completely unpredictable. Um, in other words, the future is not predictable, uh, as Colin Gray has said uh, um, forcefully and simply, which uh, is the simple part is very unusual for him, but the forceful part is certainly not, and it's a very smart comment. The future is not foreseeable, absolutely not foreseeable. Uh, and here, in terms of the complexities of, if you will, the future, let me just uh, move on to the uh, Next slide, and let you uh, take a look. This is drawn from the Joe. Uh, Joe Gracie and I came up with that actually the uh, chart that we came up with uh, um, went all the way back to 1900, but to sort of speed up uh, um, um, my uh, discussions here and not give you a huge amount to read. I think these sort of, sort of just looking at the 10 year decades from 1940. Um, we, we, as I say, went from 1900, but from 1940 to the present underlines how absolutely unpredictable the future is when you take a look uh, at the past uh, course of events over the, uh, uh, over the 20th century. And here, of course, we get uh, uh, how many of us could, who went through the Cold War. Uh, I was born uh, in World War II and lived through the Cold War. Um, some of the earliest events that I remember, <coughs> Korean War, reading the New York Times at the age of uh, nine and 10 years old, perhaps not absorbing a huge amount, but certainly recognizing that something dreadful was going on. Um, who could possibly have imagined, even as late as 1984, 1985, that Warsaw would be in, uh, uh, in, in NATO by the year 2000? In fact, uh, in terms of the, the science of political science, which I think has misled Americans and that discipline fundamentally, hardly anybody predicted the demise of the Soviet Union right through to 1986, 1987. The biggest event, in many ways, of the 20th century did not become predictable to the great mass of analysts until 19. 88, 1989, 1990. And again, I think that underlines the com complexities of the world we live in. Um, the book, The Shaping of Grand Strategy, is very much influenced by uh, a work that I edited in the mid-1980s, uh, which sums up, I think, uh, uh, if you will, uh, the approach of the Naval War College uh, to the issues involved in strategy and policy was the book uh, called The Making of Strategy, Rulers, States, and War, which I think has uh, uh, been one of the more successful uh, um, uh, and, if you will, insightful works uh, uh, that I have uh, directed. And the process of grand strategy is equally influenced by issues such as the historical past. Um, and each nation has a different historical past. Um, uh, each one um, with very uh, different uh, sort of, uh, um, if you will, influences on statesmen uh, and leaders in the present. Um, we only have to think of the American South in terms of understanding how differently even Americans view the world in which we live. Uh, and of course, it has only been in the last 20 years, or 20 to 30 years, that our view of the Civil War, which was largely molded by, if you will, the myth makers of the South um, uh, 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 about the uh, ca catastrophe which happened to uh, the South in the period between 1860 and 1865, totally, of course, brought on by its own stupidity of its leaders, but nevertheless, uh, a, an unbelievably traumatic event uh, which uh, still dimly echoes uh, 
in terms of, of, of Southern view of the world. It's very different than Northern or Western American view. Geography, huge influence. The United States and Great Britain have as island nations, and we are an island nation, um, view the world, uh, I think, very differently from continental powers. And for us, the projection of military power, and I think we're going to be addressing that much more so than we have in the past when all of America's troops are back after the Iraq uh, and Afghanistan adventures are largely over. Um, uh, our view of the world, of course, is one in which we have to get there. I mean, again, I think one of the great faulty analysis of the period of the 1980s was the idea that somehow the Germans were wonderful because uh, their uh, emphasis on logistics was so much less than the American emphasis. The Germans didn't have to get to the war because they started it. We had to get to the war. And so consequently, our emphasis on logistics, and I would suggest that America's military forces uh, uh, very much have to be uh, cut in terms of the rest of the 21st century on the basis of what we can deploy and project from North America um, and not uh, from bases uh, that, that lie around the rest of the world. Culture. A huge influence. The nature of government. I have spent the last four or five years at the Institute for Defense Analysis working on Saddam Hussein's tapes. Uh, and uh, um, the very nature of Iraqi um, uh, society, culture, and the politics of Saddam's evil, bizarre regime made his understanding of strategy fundamentally different uh, than our understanding of strategy. And then, of course, there is uh, the problem of revolutionary movements. And I think we may be confronting something along those lines in terms of the Middle East when we look at the huge uh, number of young people between the ages of 14 uh, and 21 or 22, young males in particular. Um, the one, <coughs> one of the lessons of history, I would suggest, uh, is that when you have that imbalance of young males, you have often, not always, but often really dangerous times ahead, the French Revolution being perhaps the best example. And that's Clausewitz's description of um, uh, the difficulty that uh, the European powers faced uh, in uh, the period between 1792 uh, and 17. Uh, uh, and 1815, again, in terms of the capacity to understand what is happening even in a nation as familiar as France should have been to uh, the English leaders. William Pitt in uh, early 1792 said, uh, uh, the prospects for peace have never been better in a century. <laughs> William Pitt was not a bad strategist. This is William Pitt the Younger. Um, and of course, about five months later, the wars with revolutionary France began and would not end until 1815. Um, and then, of course, I think the fundamental uh, issue in all of this in terms of getting grand strategy right is understanding the other. As uh, Sun Tzu, I think, quite accurately says, uh, um, you first of all have to understand yourself, which I don't think we do a terribly good job at, but you sure better understand the other. And here, I think we have done an abysmal an abysmal record over the past uh, um, uh, 40 or 50 years. Very good in terms of Soviet Union, not so good with everybody else. I think one of the fundamental focuses of this book, which I want to emphasize, uh, uh, is that individual leaders make grand strategy, not bureaucracies, not uh, um, uh, if you will, military leaders, but statesmen, political leaders, are the crucial enabler of successful grand strategy, or uh, if you will, the catastrophic failure of grand strategies. Uh, and here, I think uh, uh, there are a number of similarities among, if you will, the greatest uh, uh, and smartest of, uh, of, uh, uh, of those who have done grand strategy well. Bismarck, Pitt, obviously, um, Salisbury, um, Churchill, Roosevelt, Truman, uh, is that nearly all of them were 
quite familiar, quite, if you will, sophisticated students of history. Not necessarily specific histories. Lincoln very clearly did not read much German, current German history, but Lincoln had read all the ancient classics, Plutarch, um, Thucydides, um, Tacitus. And I would suggest to you that that gave him a, uh, uh, Bismarck also was a man who had read enormously in the classics. Gave them the capacity, if you will, uh, to evaluate the possibilities, not to cast a straight line into the future. Um, again, I think there's a sort of a tendency to believe that what we need is a grand strategy laid out in some sort of stone that we can follow directly into a wonderful future in which everything is assured. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Adolf Hitler, of course, followed that strategic approach uh, to the c catastrophic smash up of uh, April 1945. Uh, in fact, strategy is a matter of flexibility, adaptability to uncertain uh, um, uh, and ambiguous events. Um, it demands, if you will, a thorough understanding uh, uh, of uh, the international environment and, a, if you will, a sixth sense which is difficult uh, to predict who will have it and who will not. Again, in looking at uh, um, and I'm writing a, a book on the Civil War right now to escape from my experiences in D.C. Uh, uh, Lincoln very clearly, nobody predicted that Lincoln would have that sense, and yet very clearly in retrospect, Lincoln had uh, that w wonderful political and strategic sense, um, as well as the advantage uh, of, uh, of uh, a, 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 the fact that nearly everybody underestimated him which he was more than happy not to disabuse them of, because in fact, while they were underestimating him, he was picking their uh, pockets. Uh, I think what's also clear is that the democracies have done particularly well in the casting of grand strategy in terms of their leadership and the capacity of those leaders to put together, uh, if you will, uh, successful alliance systems to work, if you will, understand the capacity, weaknesses, strengths of their allies. And I would suggest to you that sort of one of the most uh, arrogant and stupid conceptions uh, of the post-Cold War period was uh, the, the belief that the United States was entering a unipolar moment in which we could dispense with allies. And we've already paid a heavy price for that. And those days, I think, are very rapidly going uh, uh, by the board. And here, if you're going to put together a successful alliance, whether it be one that has existed for a long time like NATO, or um, a, uh, uh, an alliance of the willing, uh, then in fact it becomes crucial that you understand that your allies have fundamentally different view of the world, different aims, and so compromise, but uh, excuse me, a, a, a grand strategy in an alliance world demands compromises, a willingness to address, if you will, um, the needs of your allies, uh, and uh, if you will, um, a willingness at times to stand uh, uh, back. Our problem, I would suggest, is that as I look forward in the coming decades of the 21st century, and I suppose most historians are pessimists, certainly Thucydides was, um, is that I think we are largely unprepared to understand the other. Um, we are a nation ignorant of history and languages and other cultures. Um, one of the more depressing moments, although I love teaching at the Naval Academy, um, was to discover that of the plebes uh, uh, um, taking uh, um, the history courses that I taught there, I taught one each semester to the plebes on naval strategy uh, and uh, U.S. naval strategy and naval history, was the fact that they divided with their 1,300, 1,200 SATs into three neat groups. One third had been well educated, had had parents, or teachers, or their own interests, had developed, if you will, a quite sophisticated understanding of the complexities of history uh, and not just U.S. history. The second third maybe had some grasp of U.S. history, knew that World War II had occurred in Europe and in the Pacific, had heard of Hiroshima, uh, and then one third of them couldn't find 
could not find West Point on a map, did not know where the Hudson River was, did not know what the Tennessee River was, couldn't give you the, the dates of the Civil War or who the important generals of battles were. Uh, and I found that really discouraging because it, I think one, one more indication of the fundamental ignorance of the American public uh, in general uh, about, uh, if you will, history. And of course, um, our politicians and leaders reflect that. And of course, that will be reinforced by the study of, of, of history in our universities. I happen to like social history and think it's important, but the fact that virtually all of our important universities have tossed study of military history, strategy, strategic history, and diplomatic history, and political history, and intellectual history out the window suggests, I think, really dangerous times because we will be even less well informed about history in the future. And I would suggest to you that there is no better example of this ignorance than our intelligence agencies and the Department of Defense. As somebody who, uh, in uh, his academic career, having come back from Vietnam in 1969 to get my PhD at Yale, um, uh, has tried to focus, if you will, on using uh, history uh, to, if you will, uh, prepare officers uh, um, to better address the surprising questions uh, uh, of uh, the future, I find it really depressing that we manage to um, we manage to repeat every single mistake we made in Vietnam as if Vietnam had not happened. And one can certainly uh, criticize uh, President Bush and Mr. Rumsfeld for their mistakes, but I would suggest to you the military is equally culpable. And uh, it is almost as if H.R. Um, McMaster's wonderful book, Dereliction of Duty, was repeated again in the period 2003-2004. And not only that, but of course, if, if a few people in the Pentagon had bothered to read uh, the memoirs by the British General Haldane, who commanded the British forces in putting down the rebellion in Mesopotamia, they would have discovered uh, that uh, um, all of his warnings were there, written about how you deal with an Arab insurgency, uh, and we managed to repeat every mistake the British made in 1920. Um, the problem with the intel agencies, of course, I think is, is one also of culture lack of knowledge of history, and particularly lack of knowledge of language. And I would suggest to you that if you don't know some foreign language, you can't understand foreign cultures for the most part. I think the approach to fixing our intel agencies, which obviously uh, had some real problems in 2001, was suggested to me by uh, Admiral Long on a committee that I served to look at NDU. Uh, in the uh, late 1980s, Admiral Long's comment was that Washington, uh, and I think we could say the intel agencies are based on the principle of if you can't eat it and you can't make love to it, he used another word, um, you reorganize it. <laughs> and again, when you have a situation in which uh, ap apparently uh, less than 15% uh, of the intelligence uh, uh, analysts uh, in the CIA read or speak a foreign language, you've got problems. Because in fact, let me suggest to you, um, one of our great advantages uh, in the 20th century was that we understood our opponents better than they understood us. I'm not so sure we're going to understand our opponents in the 21st century since their culture and languages are so different than us. Um, we're going to understand them better than they understand I think that's a very dangerous situation. Well, with that, let me stop. And uh, um, thank you for coming to listen to me. And I'll take any questions that people have. Uh, just a comment on your last point. That voice is out of the bar. You, you, that's already settled. You have no idea about the most likely to be a competitor, especially what's happened there in the last 20 years. Speak up just a little bit. China. Oh, yes. Um, uh, one of the things we have no idea what's happening there, but the last 25 years become very different than it used to be. 
absolutely. Uh, and there's another aspect of this which I think uh, um, it's very difficult to predict exactly where they're going right now. Um, um, and I'm not sure that they know, but one of the things that I've heard from Walter Walter is that the debate that's taking place about national security in China is being waged in terms of quotations of uh, not just Sun Tzu, but a whole bunch of, of people who wrote 200, 300 years BC. Uh, and since we don't even understand the language, getting at what the, the nature of that debate, I think one of the things that, in terms of their understanding us, that I found really worrisome, I got this from Bob Scales at the Army War College when I was up there in 1999. In 1999, I can't speak for today, but 1999, the PLA had more officers in American graduate school than the American services had in American graduate schools. They're going to understand us, I'm afraid, much better than they're going to understand English. English. Lots of but again, how we handled China, um, because I think the worst of all things would be a, a reemergence of, if you will, a Cold War between the United States and China. But whether it comes about or not, it's going to depend upon how skillfully we, uh, we deal with them. And, uh, that absolutely requires uh, um, uh, an understanding of the Chinese and Chinese civilization. Um, I'm, of course, lucky uh, uh, in that China has not fully emerged and as a Europeanist who writes about the Germans and the Brits uh, uh, as a military historian. Uh, uh, by the time uh, they do emerge in one way or another, I'll be long dead. Any more questions? Yes. First of all, Professor, thank you very much for coming. I think it's a very interesting talk. Um, it's always good to have someone, you always think someone's brilliant when they think all the things you do. So <laughs> thank you. Um, that said, uh, OK, here we are. I think everything you've said is, is, is correct. But how then shall we be saved? Uh, I mean, here we are. Uh, things look bad. But uh, somehow we've got to turn these trends around. Unless we're just going to turn the lights out and throw our hands up and give up. Um, you know, if you go back to 1942, uh, President Roosevelt gave a fireside chat in which he invited Americans to go out and buy an atlas and follow along with me as we win this war. Um, and there was actually a measurable surge in the, uh, in the sales of atlases. Um, and I sort of think back, I wasn't around. My father was leaving for the war. I doubt, my, my grandmother did buy an atlas, by the way. Uh, I doubt she knew where New Caledonia was or all of the, the, the places that then became very, very famous. But somehow we managed to do that with leadership. Um, are we in a situation where our salvation is beyond some serious presidential leadership? Uh, or would leadership, such as we've had in the past, do it? Um, the, the great advantage uh, uh, that uh, we have is that uh, I, I would suggest that we do manage to change leaders um, with, with some regularity. Um, the difficulty is, is that uh, uh, it's, uh, like all things, in, in tyrannies are much worse, uh, is that it's very much a matter of luck. Uh, and it, as uh, I think a number of, of the older people in this room recognize, if you haven't put the ga intellectual gas into your tank when you come to Washington to work uh, in the business of strategy and policy and, uh, and National Security Council, you don't have time to put it in one day later. And, and, and I think the difficulty here is that, um, uh, and here particularly, the, uh, any kind of grant and strategic design has got to be run by a president who is willing to take some time to think through these issues. Um, and, and, and the problem is we have developed a political culture in which everybody, uh, exacerbated of course by CNN and Fox News and that, that everybody want, is always reacting uh, to what, what, whatever, and, and, and uh, there's a certain lack of discipline in terms of science and her reply. But, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a matter of luck. You know, what, what is the saying? Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, 
God takes care of drunks, Irishmen, and the United States of America. Uh, and, you know, one of the great ironies is, of course, we have had periods of absolutely appalling leadership. Uh, uh, the uh, Pierce uh, and uh, Buchanan and uh, crew that ran the United States in the 19, 1850s was, was so appallingly out of touch with reality and, and in many ways, uh, uh, um, evil men in the sense that they were completely irresponsible. Um, uh, and then, of course, we had the 1920s, which was not much of an improvement. Uh, we seem to, uh, when great crises come, uh, elect leaders uh, who um, uh, show, I mean, I think here, character is essential, but also the sense of, of history as something much more complex uh, uh, than we historians or political scientists. And so one can only have, because leadership at the top is absolutely essential if you're going to make any change, if you will, in the culture. Uh, and there's a price to be paid in terms of changing the culture. Can I ask you a follow-up yes. on that? Because you, you mentioned the culture. I mean, there's the leadership at the top, but there's also the nation being led. Uh, my grandmother didn't know where New Caledonia was, but she was amenable to being led uh, by, by a, a president in whom she had confidence. Um, Professor Rufus Spears, whom you've probably run across at some point, makes the argument that America is very much uh, at a crossroads now, and to preserve its power, to preserve its position in the world, essentially to be an empire, to be a superpower. There's going to have to be some internal changes in the United States. He doesn't quite go on to say what those are, but obviously by making an analogy with the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, it's fairly clear what he's thinking. Uh, are we at that point where the political culture simply impedes us from putting together a coherent strategy? No, in the sense that, 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 that the uh, election of a president was very much of a crapshoot in the sense that that it is the person at the top who has to have some vision and some drive. Um, uh, all the changes at the margin in terms of reorganizing things um, don't do anything. Uh, and again, I think we're going to face some huge um, uh, issues in terms of downsizing the military, downsizing the intel agencies, how that's done, the kind of ruthlessness that would get rid of lots of people probably in the middle of higher levels. And open that, uh, those other things up. Uh, how we did the downsizing uh, in uh, the period after the Cold War, 91, 92, 93, was I think a catastrophe in the sense that we just simply sort of cut everybody 15% without making any more choices. And uh, um, I think uh, we need to have a Secretary of Defense so backed up by a President willing to make some hard choices. Same thing in terms of the intel agencies. But those who don't speak a foreign language, those who don't have any any knowledge of specific areas uh, um, are just simply going to have to go sell insurance. And uh, oh, by the way, there'll be the CNN will be leading and possibly leading, if you will, the screaming of the piggies about you know we're losing all these wonderful, brilliant people. Yes, ma'am. I'm totally a military. I don't like wars, but what I'm thinking is that America seems to always think of war. China, we have watched it in Africa and in, in, in South America, you can see they move in economically, they buy companies, they move, build, process, um, whatever. But they don't have the soldiers everywhere, maybe secretly, that I don't know. But America has to have army here, army there, army there, and then you can't finance it anymore. Instead of building your own country as a healthy country and looking around your neighbors, we forgot about South America altogether, but we are right across the, the, the oceans on either side and trying to keep things going, and I think that is to my mind. There is, uh, let me remind you, a wonderful statement that Trotsky made uh, um, before he took over as the commissar of the Red Army, uh, when he was, I think, sti still working, uh, um, running a newspaper in Brooklyn, probably none of you knew that. So be a relevant piece of information. Um, the proxy said, uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And the problem is that we live in a world uh, in which uh, human conflict is going to be there until there aren't any humans, whether we like it or not. The issue, uh, and, and here is, 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 is where I would argue 
that we went on a very dangerous track in the late 1990s and 1990s in, in which we were trying to make war, if you will, from the American point of view, easy to do. And we discovered in Iraq that there's no such thing as an easy war. Um, from my perspective as a military historian, the war must always be a last resort, a last resort uh, uh, that defends absolutely essential principles. Um, uh, and I don't see much sense of that in the top leadership, that while we're pulling out of, uh, of uh, Iraq, um, we're still very much um, confused about exactly it, what it is we're doing in Afghanistan. And I was on a, I was on a set, CENTCOM study group in which a number of us looked at Afghanistan and, and uh, did some economic analysis that if you raise, if you spent somewhere around 40 to 50 billion dollars military and aid in Afghanistan and you managed over the next five years to grow the Afghan economy 10% per year, pretty, pretty fast rate, that Afghanistan would reach uh, the level of Chad in five years in terms of GDP. And, you know, I mean, again, that those are the kinds of fundamental questions that need to be asked at the very beginning as why are we doing this? And I don't think it's been asked in terms of Afghanistan, partially because the president made a terrible mistake when he was running for office of uh, dissing Bush over Iraq, which was ironically in terms of the accidents of history about the kind of turnaround, enough so we could get out and, and, and after all, it's going to be the Iraqis who are going to make it or, 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 or fail. Um, but he said Afghanistan was the war we had to win, that this was the important one, which again, I, there's no evidence for that at all, and I think it, uh, a terrible mistake. So he's been hoist on his own petard, um, and we'll see next year whether he has the toughness to say, okay, we're coming home. Now, we, we've done our bit, and we're thrilled here. Um, I recommend for those of you who um, want to learn a little bit more about what the sharp end is like in Afghanistan, there's a book and a movie. The book is called War by Sebastian Younger, and the movie is called Estropo, which is about that s the same place, and yes. it's grim reading and, and grim. Uh, I, I think Sebastian Younger's book is, is a great book. I mean, truly a great book you know, in terms of its economy of language and its brilliance and sophistication uh, uh, about understanding the issue. Um, you know, um, the problem is, is that there's a tendency among too many politicians uh, to think about re-election, and yet let me also emphasize that uh, that was very much at the heart of Lincoln's strategic approach in 1864. That if you, uh, you know, you if you want to finish out your policy, direct your grand strategy, you are influenced in terms of by the Constitution of the United States, and oh by the way, in terms of those who think we need to fix the U.S. government and make it more efficient. Um, which seems to suggest some sort of a more direct action. Um, uh, I'd rather have the same bumbling inefficiency we have now than a tyranny. Um, just imagine the TSA if it were really good at real powers. Uh, yes? Um, I think I heard you say that uh, we depended on bases around the world, and we're, we're now going to have to rethink that and only depend upon mobilizing from here. Can you say some more about that? Well, I think the projection of power, um, again, from my perspective, uh, uh, is that if most of our troops, which seems to be the plans, and I think is a sort of re real, realistic uh, view, uh, even in the Pacific, we, we are pulling out of Okinawa and moving uh, uh, the Marines back to Guam. Um, although the island will not sink as some congressman for a while thought. Um, uh, that, again, confronts us with the problem of, of projecting power to places that we think matter. Because in the final analysis, there is no threat in North America, military threat. Mexico is not going to try and get the uh, Southwest back. Um, Canada um, is Canada. Great hockey. Um, good maple sugar, um, sometimes good weather, <laughs> if you like, July. Uh, uh, and uh, um, so that, so that the, the reason, and, and I would argue that the sizing of the American forces must absolutely depend 
and the capacity to move those forces out of the continental United States within six months. If you can't do that, then we don't need them. Um, uh, and in terms of sort of the troubles in northern Mexico, which appears to be bubbling away, uh, getting worse and worse, uh, um, um, the last thing an American president should ever do is to commit American troops to northern Mexico because the Mexicans have not forgotten what happened in the 1840s. We have, because we don't pay any attention to history, but the Mexicans have not forgotten what we did to them then. And uh, uh, we would be asking for a catastrophe in the kind of U.S. force. Um, so that, again, that's, that, that's my sense that, that the sizing of U.S. forces should be entirely dependent on, uh, on the capacity to project military forces, uh, which means I would argue a much heavier emphasis on the Navy, um, uh, some on the Air Force, uh, and then what's projectable in terms of the Army and Marine Corps. That includes Korea, Bahrain. Well, I don't, again, in terms of, I think a lot of those bases are, I mean, some of those bases we will keep, although if North Korea collapses, I see no sign of North Korea collapsing, but given what happened in the Soviet Union, given what those idiots are doing out there, it's fully capable of collapsing in the next year or two. Um, or it may go on for 40 years, or it may invade the South, in which case projection of military power from the continent of the United States becomes very important. Um, I can't predict the future, um, and uh, um, if we are entering a, a period of relative peace, uh, I see us, uh, for example, in terms of bases in the Arab world, I think that's the worst thing we can have, because I think in terms of uh, a flag being waved uh, in front of the uh, natives, including places like Bahrain, uh, um, which has not been, demonst the demonstrations there have not been aimed at the U.S., but it could turn very quickly. Yeah. Um, I served in the Pentagon during the Carter administration. And the, there was a very strong sense of the military, as they often put it, uh, in private at least. This was the first war they were not allowed to win. Uh, in other words, I think there could be a social danger of, of a disillusioned military who feel they've been set out there and and then they had the rug pulled out from under them. They weren't given the resources. The targeting was done from thousands of miles away. And then they were scapegoated that they didn't get the job done. Um, do you see that as a, you know? No, I think the huge difference, of course, they, were, and they have not been scapegoated here in terms of any failures. Okay. Um, uh, because, in fact, it, it, Iraq turned out relatively much better than it should have. Uh, but we were lucky. Um, uh, and I, I would argue the military, uh, U.S. military has been so heavily, if you will, um, educated in terms of, of uh, the courses that it does in the professional military education system that, that I, I don't see that as a problem, at least for now. Uh, I, I, think, I think the issue, of course, comes uh, um, how long can we sustain a commitment in Afghanistan in terms of getting people to volunteer for the military when you see something like we're struggling. Okay. Again, we're still not, we're not having problems with recruitment now, probably helped by the uh, bad economy. And the fact that actually, which seems to have some influence over people joining up, um, Columbia right now has something around 200 to 250 former veterans on GI Bill writing, being government paying 40,000 a year for them to go through Columbia. None of them, very few of them would ever have thought of going to Columbia. But uh, now they have the money, uh, and many of them, of course, have uh, been very smart, unmotivated, undirected, uh, 17, 18-year-old males, the way all of us who, who have raised children and young males know they can be, um, and have gotten motivation in the military if they survive. Yeah, I think what's going to be interesting is I think there's going to be a turnaround politically in the sense that a lot of people are worried about the idea that so few people in Congress have military experience. I think that's going to change in terms of this new sort of group that's getting very good education thanks to the GI Bill uh, and I, I think are ambitious uh, and uh, going to work their way into the system. I mean, just to follow on, um, I thought one, one example that came to my mind that 
discussed with my wife earlier, uh, as a historical lesson, and I agree with you, the Americans are ahistoric, they just, just blanks out, is the Boer War, which was really the first of these wars that are sort of not all that different from Afghanistan and, and some of those that we might be facing in the future. And where the British, you know, the dominant world power at the time, basically won, but ended up losing. And they, they realized that victory wasn't worth anything when they were all done at great cost. And I think it affected the society thereafter. Well, we'll see in terms of, of Iraq. I think what's been largely missed by the American public um, is the nature of Saddam's regime, which was truly one of the most evil regimes uh, for the 20th century, and only the lack of the number of people available did not, did not allow him to catch up to Hitler and Mao and other uh, mass murders. But he certainly, uh, in terms of percentage terms, didn't expect. I mean, um, none of those sort of great tyrants in the 20th century used gas uh, uh, on their own people, which he did uh, on two occasions, one against the Kurds and then the 91 um, <laughs> revolt uh, march uh, they used. Uh, uh, not just mustard gas, but apparently uh, uh, sarin as well. So uh, this is this is an extraordinarily evil regime, uh, and so whatever comes afterwards in Iraq, and I, 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 you know, again, it's it's up in the air, but it's much better now than it was under Saddam, and much less dangerous. Um, however, I think you know, I mean, again, the revolutions occurring throughout the Islamic, uh, the Arab world right now, um, very clearly deserve close watching. Um, because I don't think anybody has a clue how they're going to turn out. Yeah? A comment, a question. Apropos that, I've been trying to, the Arab uh, changes, I've been trying to think of historical analogies of something that happened within weeks and changed everything. And the only thing I can get that I'm winning was 1848 in Europe. So all the old regimes at least temporarily, disappeared. It was almost overnight. I mean, each place was different. But the change was vast. And only that 1849 did the yeah. counter yeah, that's a very good point. reaction happen. And that was unpredictable whether it would work, and it didn't work everywhere. So uh, that's the on only event I, I can think of in reasonably modern time frame that's like it, that reminds me of. In one ruler after another goes. But it's like a spread. disease, it's spread throughout the whole oh boy, I right. think what's changed yeah. is that um, the capacity of, of if, if you will, uh, uh, revolutions to sustain themselves uh, in the 21st century are going to go up because the 48 thing died out by 49, 50. Yeah. Um, but look at Libya now. I mean, the, the, the insurgents are not doing well, to put it mildly and politely. Well, again, here, this is the great issue that, uh, that our 24-hour networks are not, are not willing to address, which is, yes, Gaddafi was doing dreadful things to his people, um, but the, the idea that simply sending in a few airplanes to bomb some of his tanks yeah. would fix it all and solve the political and uh, cultural problems of 40 years of misrule um, is so naive. And of course, you know, uh, if, if it turns out to be a tar baby, it could uh, for both the Europeans and for us because we'll have to bail them out. Um, and of course, CNN six months from now will be screaming about the stupidity and Fox as well of the politicians that got us involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, there's a level of irresponsibility uh, uh, in the news networks uh, um, uh, that uh, takes your breath away. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, for, for the idea that somehow our media is more irresponsible doing the Civil War book, which is a military history, a grim military history of adaptation. Um, I have done a fair amount of outside reading beyond that, and the newspapers at the time are so irresponsible and so dishonest and so uninformed um, and so partisan that it makes Fox and CNN look like wonderful little the road uh, um, uh, uh, partisans. Well, that was also the case in the earlier years of the Republic. I mean, the media have not been all that great. But again, it's yeah. Americans, yeah. of course. Why would we say yeah. everything is new? So the so that so that if you will, the partisanship that we're seeing right now yeah. is something new. If you look at 
it is well remembering that it, it well remembered that in the late 50s, uh, the uh, uh, senators uh, and uh, uh, members of the House of Representatives went armed into the Senate and House chamber because they expected uh, um, uh, to have a, a real bloodbath, which actually came close to happening. Um, and we don't seem to have reached that point yet. But uh, uh, without a pers historical perspective, then things look awful today. The performance of the Republicans, for example, in, 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 in 1939, 1940, the isolationists, is, is so irresponsible as to take your breath away. Because then the world really was going to hell in a handbasket. And the fact that the Congress of the United States renewed the draft in July 1941 by one vote, by one vote, with, with German armies now three quarters of the way to Moscow, that takes your breath away. Yes, sir. Going back to your uh, previous comment about you can't eat it or make love to it and so forth. Three or four years ago, uh, there was an initiative started called the Project on National Security. Are you familiar with that? Um, I sort of dimly. Okay. And they were there was much fanfare about how they were going to reorganize the national security structure. It turned out about a 700, 800 page report. And it died after three or four years. There doesn't seem to be any uh, initiative to actually do reform. Could you, could you comment on that? Yeah, um, I, to me, um, uh, there is a rather simple reform that could add a great deal, which would be to put the way Eisenhower did for eight years. The NSC was in charge, so when there was a cabinet meeting, uh, and something was decided, and state decided it didn't like it, and decided not to. The NSC came down on them with a hammer because they were an executive authority that uh, that Eisenhower was using to ensure that the, the sheet of music, uh, in terms of decision, everybody sang the same. Um, that, of course, would get a lot of upset in Congress, and Congress would probably ask to uh, uh, sort of review. Uh, the cabinet level appointment than the NSC, which is now entirely out of the, the system. But I, I think that would go a long way to at least getting the U.S. government to sing on the same same page. Uh, the other part is 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 you have to the president can't reorganize the Department of Defense. He's got to pick somebody and give them the authority to go and and cause a lot of upset and and turmoil. Um, you all, having lived in this town uh, now, uh, virtually everybody has no. Canceling an aircraft carrier would cause real excitement in certain elements uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, uh, removing one of the Army divisions, or I mean, there are a whole set of things that, that, that and, and the fight will be long and hard. Deciding to make major changes will get screams from the Hill. And oh, by the way, there's nothing new about serving officers running over to uh, the hill to tattle on what dreadful things are going to happen to them and how the nation will never recover. It's well worth remembering that we have had serving officers run for the office of president of the United States, which seems to me somewhat of a, you know, an indication that civil military relations aren't quite as bad. But again, it, it, it requires a stay in the course. The president willing to back up as secretary of defense to do some really hard things um, uh, to get a coherent defense rather than what I think is going to happen with the downsizing that's coming, which is everybody will get 10% cut, which gives you nothing. No hard decisions you make. Uh, and one of the places where, which I think are, is essential to, it, if you will, the understanding of our officers to strategic issues um, uh, uh, is the professional military educational system. And now that I've scaled and scored, uh, I really have worries about uh, about the really bad old days returning, where it was where professional military education was viewed as a wonderful chance for officers to work on their handicap and get to know their families. Any more questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, our sales representative should be available in the reception area if anyone would like to purchase the book and have Dr. Murray sign the book. Thank you for coming. By the way, how much is the book? You, That's you, a great you, question. You Let me go look at the cost. I, I think it's about $25 is what I, I think it is, but I don't know what Cambridge is selling it for these kinds of things. Right. It's got a very lovely cover on it, although, and I picked the, helped pick the, the cover, it has nothing to do with with what, what's in the book. It's it's, it's Washington receiving the, the surrender of the Brits at Yorktown. Uh, we, don't, that's, we don't discuss the Revolutionary War at all. So, but it's a nice cover. <laughs> well, that event had a strategic consequence. Oh, you! No one ex <laughs> expected. I mean, there was, no one knew that this was it. I mean, you hardly ever do know. Absolutely.